Good evening. I'm Susan Ormiston, and this is The National. The most important thing uh, for me is to continue working on behalf of Canadians. The finance minister tries to take the focus off conflict of interest allegations by donating millions to charity, but it may not be enough for the ethics commissioner. At issue will weigh in on the Morno controversy. Canada will resettle 1,200 survivors of ISIS. Tonight, you'll hear a Yazidi's family's harrowing ordeal to survive. Plus... What happened with your ghost, Senya? The case for expanding early childhood education. A new report says it's good for the Canadian economy. A week ago, in the thick of a controversy involving his personal finances and shares in a family company, Bill Morneau said he needed to do more to make sure that Canadians had confidence in him. He has already agreed to place his assets in a blind trust and sell off his shares in Morneau Chappelle. Today, the finance minister took another step, aimed at stamping out a political firestorm, but his critics say it did the opposite. David Cochran has our story tonight. This controversy has already been politically expensive for Bill Morneau. Now it is personally expensive. I've decided not only to sell all of my and my family's assets and the company I built with my father for 25 years, I've also decided to donate any difference in value in those shares from the time I was elected until now. Those few words add up to big money. When he became finance minister, Morneau Chappelle stock traded at $15.58 a share. Today, it closed at $21.08. That's a gain of $5.50 a share times 1 million shares, which means Morneau will donate as much as $5.5 million to charity to make this go away. We've made a decision that the most important thing uh, for me is to continue working on behalf of Canadians. Uh, I'm not sure what that value is, and of course it's not that's sure not until it happens. Right. We're talking millions of dollars. Whatever the value is, that's our decision. We've decided to make that donation. He hacked only when he's trapped in the corner, and it was, it was in a real profitable, personal conflict of interest for him and his family. I think what we saw today was an admission of guilt. From my experience, people don't generally pay a fine or a fee if they're innocent of something. Rather than letting it drop, the opposition says this is just proof of wrongdoing, and they say there's even more out there. Cullen has asked the Ethics Commissioner to investigate Morneau's role in drafting pension reform legislation known as C-27. Legislation, his critics say, will mean big money for Morneau Chappelle. Today, the Ethics Commissioner wrote Cullen to say she will look into it. Your letter leaves me with concerns in relation to Mr. Morneau's involvement with Bill C-27. Consequently, I will follow up with Mr. Morneau. So Morneau will go under the microscope of the Ethics Commissioner, though it isn't at the level of a formal investigation. His office says the minister will cooperate fully with the Commissioner and answer any questions that she has. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Canadians have to pay. Those were the words of Justin Trudeau today as he defended a $31 million compensation package for three men wrongly accused of terrorism. Margo McDermott has the details. The Prime Minister didn't mince words today about three Canadians who were tortured. I hope people uh, take notice of this. I hope people uh, are um, angered. And then this is the cell. This is actually, if you, you know, you can see it, that's smaller than a grave. Abdullah Al-Malki is one of three men who ended up in Syrian jails like this one shortly after 9-11. Al-Malki, along with Ahmed El-Mati and Muyad Nuruddin, were wrongly accused of terrorism and tortured, in part because of information provided to Syria by the RCMP and CSIS. The government reached a settlement with them last March. Now we know they're getting $31.3 million, although it's not clear how much each received. We have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms that guarantees uh, protection for Canadians. And uh, when uh, governments, uh, regardless of which stripe, uh, do not defend those rights, Canadians have to pay. The Liberals blame the previous Conservative government for ignoring the recommendations of a special inquiry and refusing to compensate the three men. Delay is always expensive. 
This human rights lawyer says the money sounds like a lot, but it only goes so far. Torture leaves permanent uh, damage that the, these men will carry with them forever, and so no amount of money can compensate them for that. Canada has settled other cases like this. In 2007, Meher Arar was awarded $11.5 million after he was jailed and tortured in Syria, in part because of Canadian intelligence actions. In July, Omar Khadr received $10.5 million after the Supreme Court found his civil rights were violated when he was detained in Guantanamo Bay. He is uh, not entitled to any payment, in my opinion, but when we look at the situation of these three individuals, Marar Arar as well, uh, where they are proved to be innocent, uh, they're definitely entitled to this payment. The government is requiring more oversight of intelligence gathering and tightening up rules about how information obtained by torture can be used. Part of its effort to prevent more suffering and more expensive settlements. Margaret McDermott, CBC News, Ottawa. Iraq's Yazidi minority has been attacked, taken hostage and abused by ISIS over the last three years. But as the militant group loses ground, more and more Yazidis are escaping to safety, and many of them here to Canada. CBC News has learned that at least 800 ISIS survivors have arrived here this year, including one family we spoke to living near Toronto. Magda Gabrasalase has their harrowing story. This Yazidi family is safe in Canada now, but they are still haunted by the memories of what ISIS did to them, beginning with the invasion of their northern Iraqi village in August of 2014. <laughs> Her name is Melkia. She and her sister-in-law Basima married two brothers, but were widowed by ISIS and forced into sex slavery like thousands of other Yazidi women and girls. The painful details of the first time she was raped are still raw for Basima. <laughs> At the thought of being raped again, she wanted to commit suicide. During all of that, Basima had no idea where her daughter was, and her other son, Hadar, was living through his own nightmare. He was 10 years old when ISIS took him to become a child soldier. It's because of accounts like this that the UN declared what's happening to the Yazidis to be genocide. The Canadian government committed to resettling 1,200 survivors of ISIS this year. CBC has learned of those who have arrived so far, 81 percent are Yazidi. But the founder of One Free World International says the government can do more. Increasing the numbers from 1,200 to 3,000 or 4,000 I think is doable. We can also help them on the, their own ground. International protection around their, their areas and their territory is important. Melkia and Basima can't help but think about those left behind. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. For now, Ottawa says it's only focused on fulfilling its commitment to resettle a full 1,200 ISIS survivors by the end of the year. Magda Gebra Salasa, CBC News, Toronto. Hallucinogenic drugs, hypnosis, electric shocks to the brain, some of the methods used in secret CIA mind control experiments on Canadian citizens during the Cold War. Now, six decades later, some justice. CBC News has learned that the federal government has quietly paid settlements in a number of cases where patients were used as human guinea pigs, including one woman who never recovered. Evan Dyer has more on this dark chapter.
As the Korean War ended, the CIA saw a troubling pattern, returning prisoners of war critical of the American way of life. Now you just sit there quietly and cooperate. Movies like The Manchurian yes, Candidate stoked fears of a new communist weapon, brainwashing. The CIA wanted to understand more about brainwashing. It had money and it was ready to fund experiments. And that's what led it here to the Allen Memorial Institute, then one of the most prestigious psychiatric hospitals in Canada, and its director, Dr. Ewan Cameron. These are the days and ours are the occasion. Cameron's patients, many of them women with postpartum depression, became guinea pigs in an experiment called depatterning, breaking down the mind with repeated electric shocks and drugs, including massive doses of LSD. He, he took my mother away from me. Alison Steele was four when her mother Jean fell into a depression. And we have pictures of her skiing, horseback riding, always a smile, happy, a, a person that I didn't know. I never saw my mother this way. Sixty years after her mother's treatment, Alison Steele finally has her medical records. This is where I got to know my mother, what happened to her, the horror that she went through. Pacing the hall this morning, saying, I'm just a prisoner, I feel like Jesus on the cross, can feel the nails in my hands and feet. It's just like being buried alive. Somebody, please do something. Jean Steele was kept in a drug-induced coma for weeks. Her brain repeatedly shocked. Dr. Cameron broke her down, but wasn't able to put her back together. So I just learned over time to not talk to her because I knew she couldn't. So that made me angry. In the 90s, the government of Canada, which also funded Cameron's experiments, compensated several dozen patients, but only those who had been completely depatterned, reduced to incontinence, unable to tie shoelaces. Jean Steele wasn't damaged enough, so she and hundreds more received nothing. These experiments were done without the informed consent of the patients. Lawyer Alan Stein took up some of the rejected cases. The government's paid a number of settlements since, including $100,000 for Allison Steele. Many of the payments come with non-disclosure agreements. They're trying to do it quietly. It's not fair. I mean, I feel, I feel blessed that I was able to get this far for my parents. I, I really do. That's what gives me justice. I'm just grateful to be able to do it, and I hope you, I, I just hope that uh, you can hear me up there because it might bring you peace. It might bring you both peace. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Knowlton, Quebec. Coming up, we visit one of the front lines in Canada's opioid crisis. The circumstances of the last three or four months have changed our lives. A city's new approach to curtail its spike in overdoses. And later, Kim Brunhuber takes a bite out of the future. Two people have been killed in a small plane crash in Calgary. The plane owned by a flying school went down in a field not far from Springbank Airport west of the city. Two men were found dead in the wreckage. RCMP and the Transportation Safety Board are investigating. Irving Oil has been ordered to pay $4 million for offences related to the 2013 disaster in Lac Mégantique. The New Brunswick-based company pleaded guilty to 34 charges under the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act. 47 people were killed when a train bound for an Irving refinery in St. John derailed and exploded in Lac Mégantique, Quebec. Alberta is getting its first Amazon distribution center. The online retailer will hire 750 full-time employees to pack and ship orders from a facility in the Calgary area. Calgary is one of 238 North American cities vying to host Amazon's second headquarters. And that decision is expected next year. 54 years ago, Americans were shocked by the sudden death of their president. Today, thousands of documents related to JFK's assassination were finally released. But not all the documents, as had been promised, after a confusing day of mixed messages. When the rest of the files will come out is not yet certain, nor is it clear whether they will be heavily redacted. Paul Hunter tries to make sense of it all. Well, we know this much. 
24 years and 364 and a half days after the U.S. Congress set a 25-year deadline to release these documents, there's still a fight going on over what can be made public. Tonight, Donald Trump agreed to release some but not all of the remaining files on the Kennedy assassination. By a law passed in 1992, the release had to happen by midnight tonight. Today, the CIA and the FBI, citing national security concerns, argued some of the information in those documents was still so sensitive that it still has to be kept secret. And so it is. For now, Trump has set a new 180-day deadline to whittle down the remaining redactions and then release most of what will be left under wraps after today. But who knows what will happen in 180 days. Meanwhile, all kinds of documents are being released tonight, which will occupy Kennedy assassination fanatics overnight and for days and weeks and months to come. Looking for details, frankly, that most experts say likely won't change much of what we already know about that day. But to a fresh question on the matter, will today's delay infuriate conspiracy theorists everywhere? On that, we can say probably. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. A story you may remember, a terror plot to blow up a packed VIA passenger train traveling from New York to Toronto. The plan was foiled and two men were ultimately convicted, but the story has never been fully told. Tonight, a new perspective on the case from an FBI agent who was there every step of the way. The Fifth Estate, Habiba Nasheen, has more on the inside man. For years, he has been in the shadows, but now the FBI undercover agent Hello. is coming forward for his only Canadian TV interview. Still disguised with his Hollywood-style prosthetic mask, still using the pseudonym Tamar al-Nuri, but ready to talk about infiltrating the infamous Via Rail plot. His target was this man, Montreal-based PhD student Shaheb Essegayer. The FBI and the RCMP suspected him of being a terrorist. Was Shaheb a real deal? Shaheb was absolutely the real deal. Um, he was motivated beyond belief. For months, Agent Al-Nuri recorded hours of conversation that would implicate Essegayer and his accomplice, Riyad Jasser. The agent was also invited on a reconnaissance mission by the men, where they were nearly killed by a passing train. Riyad Jasser's lawyer, John Norris, says the suspects weren't capable of anything but loose talk. I think we are prepared to concede that the police had good reason to look into what Mr. Essegayer and Mr. Jasser were doing. But after that, things, I think, became quite problematic. Um, they were utterly lacking in any capacity. How realistic was that plan? <clears throat> well, would you want to find out? I've spoken to a lot of people from the Muslim community who say they don't feel like the FBI has their back, that they're constantly under surveillance, that they're targeted for their skin color. Once you hear that, what do you say to those folks? Habiba, that's another reason why I'm sitting here with you. I'm here to tell the Islamic community in Canada, in the U.S., that is absolutely false. They are not being spied upon uh, by the FBI. That's not what the community feels. I'm sitting here before you. I'm a Muslim American. I was born in the Middle East. Um, I work for the government, and I'm telling you, I have never seen or been a part of any targeted investigation where someone was targeted simply because of their faith. That's absolutely not true. Habiba Noshin, CBC News, New York. And for more on this story, including Habiba's interview with the FBI agent in full, known as Tamar El Nouri, tune in to The Fifth Estate Friday at 9 p.m. on CBC Television and at cbc.ca slash fifth. Hundreds of thousands gathered in Bangkok today for a funeral procession of Thailand's beloved monarch who died a year ago. Dozens of foreign dignitaries, including Canada's Governor-General Julie Payette, attended a ceremony ahead of his cremation, marking the end of a year of national mourning. The king was one of the world's longest ruling monarchs. 95% of Thailand's population was born during his 70-year reign. 
It's no secret that staying in school can pay off in the long term, but the age that a child begins their studies might also be beneficial. A new report suggests that getting a head start on early education is not only good for kids, but for the economy too. Aaron Collins has that story. For the Kenny family, the learning starts before their jackets are even hung up. How do you spell your name? Michael Tom is in all-day kindergarten at this private school. His little sister, not yet four, is in junior kindergarten, a program which has been a big boost for both, according to their dad. I think that uh, just getting that head start, you know, um, in their education, and then, like I said, hitting the ground running when they hit uh, senior kindergarten. But that head start doesn't come cheap. Junior kindergarten here costs $18,000 a year. What happened with your ghost, Senya? Vicki chamberlain polson has been a teacher here for 15 years. She says all kids would benefit from starting school early, but isn't sure she'll ever see it. I think the, the sticker price up front is so great, but I do know that children benefit from it. Well, a new report suggests she may be right. The study by the Conference Board of Canada says all day schooling from the age of three makes sense, but it wouldn't be cheap. It would cost about $3 billion a year to have every kid in Canada start school at three, an investment that some say would pay off over time. You would have more women working in the labour force. Uh, that would bring in additional tax revenues to the, to, to, to the governments. The children would, be, would, would have better outcomes in labour market and that would raise their income. The report suggests that every dollar invested in early childhood education would provide six dollars in economic benefits down the road. Well, not everyone agrees with that math and some say putting kids in school at such a young age has a downside. When do kids get to be kids? Uh, you know, they, 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 they don't need that amount of structure or that kind of structure at the age of three. Well, back at that Calgary private school, it's music time for the junior kindergarten class. And there's little doubt here that an early start is a good thing. But for now, at least, it's a step up that relatively few Canadian families can afford. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Straight ahead, the opioid crisis. Donald Trump declares it a nationwide public health emergency, while here in Canada, the city of Ottawa has a novel frontline approach. Polar ice will melt, and by the end of the century, this will bring floods to low-lying coastal areas. Inland, there'll be drought, and in other places, an increase in storms. Some crops could be devastated. But looking at the brighter side of things, at least our great-grandchildren should have warmer winters. Just a sample of the broad spectrum of opinion on the changes taking place in our atmosphere. Cataclysmic. Um, not a trivial matter and not one to, to be taken lightly. The greenhouse effect will wreak total havoc on the natural world. All of them are burning fossil fuels. All of them are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But if I put in too much carbon dioxide, in effect, what I'm doing is put putting a glass bowl over the entire thing. The sunlight can still go through the glass. That energy hasn't changed, but the heat from the ground cannot get out. So now there's an imbalance, so the Earth is getting warmer. Compounding the problem has been the systematic depletion of the world's forests. Trees need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. As the number of trees diminish worldwide, more carbon dioxide is left to build up in the atmosphere. The start of global warming can also mean extreme and erratic weather, and the evidence has been mounting up. I think what concerns me most about global warming, I feel like we're just in a little experiment, and that we're just not leaving anything for the future generations. Hello, Facebook viewers. Do you have a burning question about climate change? You know, what is it? How do we know? What's it doing to the planet? I'd like to find the answers to your questions. I'm Bob McDonald, and I'll be on The National next Friday responding to your questions, so send them in. You can tweet them, CBC The National, with the hashtag AskBob, or post them right here on Facebook. Your questions on climate change, let me know. If there was any doubt the U.S. was in the midst of an opioid crisis of epic proportions, 
consider this. Today, the president said at least 64,000 Americans died from overdoses last year. That's 175 deaths a day, seven lives lost every hour. And it's why Donald Trump has now declared the opioid epidemic a public health emergency, and he made it personal. Lindsay Duncombe explains. When Donald Trump gives formal speeches, he has a tendency to sound wooden, like he's reading. That wasn't the case today. We can be the generation that ends the opioid epidemic. We can do it. Addiction is something the president understands. He's experienced it within his own family. He had a very, very, very tough life because of alcohol. Trump's brother, Fred, died after struggling with alcoholism. Great guy, best looking guy, best personality, much better than mine. And he would tell me, don't drink. Don't drink. The warning worked. Donald Trump says he's never taken a sip. If we can teach young people and people generally not to start, it's really, really easy not to take them. That's why a public awareness campaign will be central to the White House plan. Doctors will be sent to rural areas. Treatment beds will be freed up. Access to addictive opioid painkillers reduced. I want the American people to know the federal government is aggressively fighting the opioid epidemic on all fronts. But today's announcement did not go as far as many had hoped. Trump declared the opioid crisis a public health emergency instead of a national emergency, meaning departments will likely have to use existing funds for the initiatives. Craig Moss lost his son to heroin. I commend the president and the first lady for reaching out and addressing this issue and letting the struggling addicts of this country know that, that there's something going to be happening. But I certainly wish that he had spoken more about what he, how he plans to attack the epidemic by not uh, providing additional funding. Another challenge for the White House is who will implement these changes. The Health and Human Services Secretary resigned because he was taking too many private jets. And the man Trump wanted to manage the drug crisis withdrew his name because of reports he was too close to pharmaceutical companies. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Our country is also grappling with an opioid epidemic. Last year, 2,800 Canadians died, their deaths connected to opioids. And the number of overdoses is rising every day in every part of the country. In Ottawa, healthcare workers are trying a new approach to help save lives, fighting fire with fire. Susan Lunn has that story from the streets of the capital. A weeknight in Ottawa's Byward Market. As people walk home from work... You have safe supplies for people? Yeah, I have the nasal and the injectable. The frontline staff at Shepherds of Good Hope are getting ready for the night shift. Everything okay? It's a constant patrol. Every day, every hour, since the summer. And if you need anything... When I first started here and we would do grounds checks, if we saw people let's say using, we would tell them like take it off property and then we started realizing that that's a danger as Daniel was saying, they could right? Die off property. Because they could die if they're by themselves. For months, fentanyl has been a crisis in Western Canada, but the drug arrived in the nation's capital in a big way this summer. Are you okay right now? Overdoses went from four a month in June to four a day by October. Stick around here. One week we weren't dealing with that stuff and then the next week all of a sudden just like Full five course. overdoses in one week. Uh, it really just came out of nowhere. So in September, healthcare workers started giving a small number of addicts clean drugs, a prescription opioid, choosing to help them get high safely rather than watching them die. The circumstances of the last three or four months have changed our lives. Dr. Jeff Turnbull left his job running the Ottawa Hospital to head up this program to help addicts. At first, he thought supervised drug injection sites were the solution. Today, he says they're nowhere near enough. They're bringing in drugs that are laced with fentanyl. So the thought would be that if we're going to have supervised safe injection sites, why would we allow them still to inject poison? Seven people who come here are already getting the intravenous opioid. Thank you for cleaning up your stuff, guys. Appreciate it. Frontline workers are hoping to get that up to 40 by next month. 
Those who have seen friends overdose think it will save lives. If it were an English perspective where the government could supply it, then at least they would know the dosage, you know, and not gamble with their, like, play Russian roulette every time they want to shoot up. Coming around again, guys. And that's not all it does for addicts. Give them resources and time uh, to work on themselves and work on getting better without having to go through withdrawal every day and feeling sick and not being able to accomplish anything because you're looking for money on the streets to get high. An extreme response to an unprecedented crisis. Susan Lunn, CBC News, Ottawa. Just ahead, at issue with their take on the conflict of interest controversy that continues to dodge the finance minister. And later, where's the beef? It cooks some medium rare, medium, mid well, well done, like a normal patty. Meat that isn't meat at all, coming up on The National. First, a look at the day's business numbers. The TSX rose 36 points. The dollar dropped a third of a cent. In New York, the Dow gained 71 points and the price of oil was up 46 cents a barrel. All right, for those of you watching us on Facebook Live, welcome and thanks for your questions. I'm going to read them here, so I need my specs on. All right, uh, from Kelsey Reed, what made you interested in journalism? Well, like all things, it starts in the home. My dad was an avid news consumer. He used to watch The National every night and go to sleep with the radio tucked to his ear, listening to CBC Radio and in the middle of the night, BBC World Service. So I kind of grew up with that. My extended family traveled a lot to Africa. There's a few missionaries back there and... Lots of, uh, lots of people traveled the world, so I got the bug, and um, it was the right thing to do for me. Uh, from Aiden Heritance. Hi, Aiden. Uh, what's one of the most uplifting stories you re you've reported on or success in the face of adversity? One of the most memorable stories was 2010 in Haiti during that horrible earthquake where more than 230,000 people died, and one baby survived. Uh, an Ottawa man had never seen his child. It was born to his girlfriend in Haiti while he was in Ottawa. When the earthquake hit, he went to find his baby. His wife died in the debris of their home, the baby in her arms. It slipped out of her grasp and she died. The baby survived in an air pocket in the debris. And local people, neighbors walking by the next day or the day after heard the baby crying, sent a guy down on a rope to fetch it and out came what the father called baby Yezu, baby Jesus, because he was a miracle baby. It was a miraculous story. I'll never forget it. Um, all right. Um, Jason Brinson, what's the process if the anchor gets ill before or during the newscast? Well, it's a fair question, and we are blessed at CBC to have so many excellent journalists who can step in and anchor this newscast. And, you know, sometimes we have some on hold if someone's feeling sick or they're called in uh, at a few hours' notice. I can't recall if anybody actually got sick on air. Luckily, that hasn't happened. Uh, Catherine C Sigbon, uh, hi Catherine, how do you develop trust with the people whose stories you tell so that they'll share with you what they know? I'm always amazed actually uh, that people do tell us their stories, tell us their most intimate moments, the moments that changed their lives, the moments they rejoiced in. It's a matter of um, trying to help them understand that this may be good for them. Uh, it's also a matter of delicately approaching people, uh, trying to uh, get to know them, uh, giving them some time and giving them the freedom to say what they need to say when you've asked to share their stories. I've often come away from shoots where people have been emotional and um, really I took their pain with me for a while and uh, thought about them for a long time afterwards. It's, uh, it's a privilege for me to be able to tell other people's stories and I treat that very delicately. Um, Caitlin Shaw, what was your favorite news story that you covered? Oh, that's such a tough question. There have been so, so many. I must say that the years I spent in Afghanistan going in and out when the Canadian forces were there were remarkable, not favorite in a positive way, but left a deep imprint on me as I watched uh, Afghanistan try to struggle with their uh, war there and the Canadians who stepped up to try to make a difference. I don't think Canadians realize what a 
footprint Canada had in especially the southern part of Afghanistan. Adam Taylor, good question. Is it hard to be unbiased sometimes? Uh, no, uh, that's my job, and I try to treat people fairly and with justice. That's all the time we have. Thanks for your great questions. constructive discussion with the Ethics Commission this morning. And I told her it was the intent of myself and my family to donate any difference in value in my family shares from the time I was elected. Bill Morneau has been trying to change the channel all week, and his attempt in the House of Commons, you saw it there, still not impressing the opposition. And now the federal ethics watchdog is looking into opening an investigation in regards to Morneau's potential conflict of interest. At Issue is here to talk about it all tonight. Andrew is with us in Toronto, Althea is in Ottawa, and Shachi Curl is in Vancouver. Well, the finance minister's not having a great time lately. Andrew, how much difficulty is he in? Uh, he's in a lot of difficulty, I think, still. He's still playing catch-up, and I think to some extent, to a large extent, this is self-inflicted. Uh, you know, we saw him divesting the shares two years after he probably should have. Now we're seeing him undoing the damage from that earlier emission by promising to, to donate the capital gain on the shares that he held when he, everyone thought he didn't or had them in a, in a blind trust. Um, and he's not really answering a lot of the questions surrounding this that you'd think would be fairly easy to answer. You know, what are, what are the other, in the other numbered companies that he holds? Uh, when did he, what decisions has he, has he recused himself of uh, as a result of his holdings of Morneau Chappelle? Did he recuse himself in particular on the question of C-27, this legislation that would arguably benefit uh, Morneau Chappelle? This is a recurring pattern in Canadian politics. You saw this with the Duffy affair, which could, could have been, I think, a two-day story had, had everyone just kind of leveled with people at the get-go. And instead what they do is you have to, it has to be kind of dragged out of them uh, by fits and starts. And it leads you to suspect, and probably not unreasonably, that if they aren't answering the questions, it's because the answers aren't terribly good. Okay, so the latest, Althea, is he's suggested that he will donate uh, any profits from the share increase between 2015 and now to charity. Is that successful strategy to, you know, quell the opposition? Well, their concern is that Mr. Morneau, when he was a private citizen, was lobbying for the type of pension changes that the government brought forward that he tabled as finance minister. So. Number one, they're saying, hey, you were asking for this as a private citizen. When you had a chance to enact government legislation, you did the exact same thing. So we think that smells funny. Then, actually, he's been forthcoming and has said that he did not recuse himself when it came to C-27. This is a piece of legislation affecting pensions that likely benefits Morneau Chappelle. He says, well, I was never in a conflict. I'm not in a conflict. I didn't need to recuse myself from that. Then, last week, he told us, actually, he did recuse himself twice from two meetings he, that he never regis registered, which is a breach of the act. But he won't say what they were about. He says, well, I don't know what they were about because I was told I needed to leave. There's a lot of questions about how this could how this could happen. <laughs> and a lot of the blame, actually, I think, lies not just with Mr. Morneau, who should be more transparent with people and probably should just, you know, say, I'm sorry, in hindsight, I should never have done this, but also Mary Dawson. Yeah. This is the ethics commissioner who has never, ever, 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 of her own accord, looked into any recusals. This is the idea that if you have a conflict of interest, and we know a lot of public office holders do, whether you actually took the steps to remove yourself from a situation that placed you in a conflict. Only once has she ever looked into this, and only when someone complained. So she's never done this. And I feel like it's important to remind the audience that Mr. Morneau is only coming forward because of transparency that has been shed, shed light on his affairs through journalists, because oh. the information was public and they were the ones that connected the dots, not because Mary Dawson laid this information out and said, oh, this looks fishy, I'm going to look into it. Okay, Shachi, I'm going to stay with Morneau for a minute. I mean, it is a complicated trail of events here. Is this something that Canadians, that will stick to Canadians, are they worried about it? He says, you know, people aren't interested in my personal business and I'm <laughs> dealing with it the way I should have. So where are Canadians on this, do you think? 
Well, look, first of all, this is not exactly turning out to be the Batman-Robin dynamic that uh, Prime Ministers Chrétien and, and Harper managed to enjoy with Paul Martin and Jim Flaherty, respectively. This is not his backup guy in terms of, you know, someone the Prime Minister can rely on to, to get out there and pitch the government message because he's already dealing with his own distractions. In terms of what Canadians are taking from this, first of all, Morneau has alienated the business community through a ham-fisted approach on these taxation changes. He has alienated the middle class and working Canadians through all of this French villa drama. And then with the extension of the conflict uh, of interest commissioner's uh, investigation into this, uh, in terms of whether or not he gives back money or, or gives it to a, a charity stemming from the proceeds of his sales, all of this really just sort of balls up into a lack of credibility or a credibility problem that Bill Morneau could be facing two years from now. Canadians may not remember every detail that Andrew and Althea have just laid out, but they will question whether or not this is the person who necessarily gets what working Canadians are going through and is the right person to be sort of out there swinging for them and working for them so, at the end of the day. very briefly, how much distraction? Is, it jo is his job at risk now? or in two years, you suggest, when he perhaps runs again? Well, I think it may I mean, be in between those two. That, that he, I think he is profoundly damaged by this in a way that is damaging to the government's brand, to the prime minister's brand, because he, they are kind of peas in a pod in a way. They're both rich guys with, with numbered companies. Uh, I don't see him necessarily stepping down next week, but in the next cabinet shuffle, I could, I could well see it. He is rapidly losing his usefulness to this government. Okay, Althea, staying with the finance minister, but turning to our money and how the government spends it. He had a fiscal update earlier in the week, uh, said, you know, there will be deficits going forward, probably past 2019, which the Liberals had promised to spend more up until that date. How is that playing out? First of all, was it a good thing to come up with this week to remind Canadians about the importance of infrastructure spending? Or is it seen as a distraction and a turning the page? Well, I think they were hoping to put some good news out there in the window so that people would start talking about, hey, they're getting a boost to the Canada Child Benefit and not talking about the small business tax cuts, which actually just, you know, bring back to mind the conflicts that uh, Mr. Morneau has had and the problems in selling the government's message on private corporations over the past several months. Um, does it change the channel? I don't know. Uh, we will see. I think that most people really care more about their pocketbooks and the ethics uh, behind Mr. Morneau, but we'll see. Um, with regards to the news, though, about the budget deficit, this is great news. I mean, the deficit is dropping by a third, but there are deficits projected as far as the eye can see. When you just think about the defense spending that the Liberals have planned for, th there will continue to be deficits. There were, basically, there are structural deficits, um, and that's not going to change. And so some people, especially on the right, will ask, well, you know, if you're not paying down the deficit and the debt in good times, mm -hmm. when do you plan on doing it? Well, that's the big question, isn't it, uh, Andrew? Is the government taking the right approach when the economy is robust? Is it, should it be looking at reducing uh, the deficit and the debt in these good times? Uh, certainly, fiscal conservatives like me would say uh, we, we're now nearly 10 years since the last recession. Uh, you never know when the next one's going to hit. Uh, these are the times, yes, when you should certainly be trying to draw down your debt so that when you have to go into deficit, uh, you can. Right now, we're going to deficit just because they want to, because they prefer to spend more than they're taking in because it's politically popular. But it's not necessarily, it doesn't mean we all go to the poorhouse, but it's just not necessarily the most prudent approach. Uh, and it's not going to be lethal to them politically either. But there once was a th feeling that any deficit was just politically toxic. I think we, we're, it's clear that's not the case. These are not terrible, out-of-control deficits, so it's not lethal to them politically. But I do think for center-right voters, for the type of center-right voters that Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin were able to draw into the Liberal co Coalition, it's another reason for them to look sideways at this government. And when they've got possibly a, 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 a newly resurgent NDP on their left, uh, it just it just boxes them in a bit that much more. Well, Shachi, that's the thing. I mean, in the West, particularly Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, they have long memories. They have many of them see Pierre Elliott Trudeau as spending his way through government. Uh, what does this say for the Liberals' vulnerability in some of those areas where their support is soft? 
Well, Justin Trudeau took a political gamble that paid off in 2015 when he said, I'm going to run these deficits to make life better for middle class Canadians. So the big question here is the deliverable on that, is the payoff on that. Do middle class Canadians, do working parents with the extension of, of these child tax credits uh, feel like uh, their home situations, their home economics are in a better place than they were two years ago? What is the stickiness here? It's one thing to really give MPs some Thing to talk about on the doorstep and say, hey, look, we ticked a bunch of boxes, we're getting things done. But does the person living in that house actually feel like their situation is better off? And when we ask Canadians that, particularly in that middle income bracket, at a time when the macro economy is going gangbusters, are you feeling better than you did two years ago? The answer is not significantly. The number who say that things are worse for them is lessening, but really the number who say that things are better is, is not significantly higher. Okay, you know, we have just a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to touch briefly on one other issue, a by-election in a Quebec riding uh, that the Liberals won on Monday. If you blinked, you may have missed it, but it's important. Uh, Andrew, why is Lac-Saint-Jean and the Liberals win there important? Because it's just about the last riding in Quebec you'd expect them to win. I think it was their worst riding in the province in the last election, even when they did quite very well in Quebec. Uh, traditionally a nationalist riding. It had been held by the Conservatives, but a nationalist Conservative, Denis Labelle. Uh, so it shows you, I guess, the power of the Trudeau brand, uh, which is often underestimated by Quebec watchers. Uh, it also shows you that the Conservatives and the NDP still have a lot of work to do, uh, new leaders in both cases, so, you know, you, I suppose you could cut them some slack. But obviously, from, from the, at a time when the Liberals are slipping nationally in a lot of other regions, they are clearly doing very well in Quebec. And Althea, this riding was uh, a block heartland. What about that? Well, they had about 20% of the vote, so it's not terrible. I mean, the NDP had about 12%, so it's a lot worse for them. And for the NDP, I'd say it's even more concerning because um, if they drop at about this 10 percent point gap elsewhere in the province, this basically gives, you know, 20 seats to the, to the Liberals in 2019. And if they can win in next saint if the Liberals can win in next saint there's really basically no other seat in the province that the party cannot be competitive in. For the Bloc, this should have been a riding that uh, they would have done extremely well in. This is like sovereigntist heartland. And if they can't win there, well, that's also a big problem for them, under their new leader as well, Martin Moulet. All right, Shachi, just turning to you for a second, what should be, we watch for uh, in terms of political trend in the next week or two? Oh, a lot going on. I think this Bill 62 issue, we've talked about it a lot uh, within the context of Quebec in the last week. It's not going away. Legislatively, it is Quebec's mess. But politically, across the country, you've got three federal leaders who have been very reluctant to say anything, particularly Justin Trudeau. You know, you would think that condemning the legislation would be something that plays to his progressive base, but a lot of that base is actually on side with the majority of Quebecers and many Canadians who say that we're not comfortable uh, with the wearing of the niqab, the majority in, in the rest of the country say so. And therefore, it is really a no-win situation for Justin Trudeau or Andrew Scheer or Jagmeet Singh. Well, lots in the political landscape. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Susan. All right, thank you. Good night. Still to come on tonight's National, A Taste of the Future, how a new Frankenburger could be a carnivore's delight.
cooks like a burger, it looks like a burger, even has the aroma. But does that make it a burger? Well, the newest food trend is coming out of Silicon Valley, and its biggest fans say, don't have cow. The meat between those buns has been engineered in a lab. Kim Brunhuber has the details. It sizzles and oozes the way a burger should. It cooks some medium rare, medium, mid well, well done, like a normal patty. But this patty is made of ingredients a cow would happily munch on. The creators of the Impossible Burger say this chef is cooking the future, a world free of factory farming. But opponents fear he's frying up a potentially dangerous Frankenburger, one among a growing number of high-tech, genetically modified, meatless meat products coming out of Silicon Valley labs. We've extracted those from plants. The burger begins life as a mixture of protein and the key ingredient the one that makes this veggie burger bleed. It starts to look kind of like lean meat. They nickname it plant's blood, an iron-containing molecule called heme from genetically modified yeast. Heme is what's responsible for the flavor generation in meat. This burger is 100% vegetarian, but another Silicon Valley company is actually growing meat using fish cells. We grow them out into massive numbers, and then all at once we turn them into the muscle, fat, and connective tissue that people want to eat. They're trying to appeal to a growing market, not vegetarians, but meat lovers looking for a healthier lifestyle. They still want the meat that they are used to, and they want that meat to be animal cells. It has a very particular taste to it that we have not yet been able to replicate using plant matter. These Bay Area companies claim they're tech platforms for food disrupting the meat industry while helping to solve environmental problems. And they're attracting hundreds of millions of dollars from investors like Bill Gates. I'd say with pretty high confidence that uh, we'll be launching in Canada within the next couple of years. It tastes meat-ish. It's so juicy I stain my shoes. But some environmentalists say these new genetically modified foods haven't been fully tested. People are becoming guinea pigs. We are being used to test food that we don't actually need. Impossible Foods voluntarily asked the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to certify its burgers as safe. The FDA said it couldn't do that without more tests, which Impossible Foods is now doing. And we have done the testing. Uh, it's absolutely safe. And that's the problem, Pearls says. It's voluntary. The FDA doesn't actually require companies to test new food products, even genetically modified ones. The technology has raced ahead, and our current regulatory system has fallen drastically behind. Silicon Valley isn't waiting around. The goal? Completely replace animals as a food production technology by 2035. They still have a lot of ground to make up. Impossible Foods can churn out 450,000 kilograms of its burger a month. As a fraction of ground beef consumed monthly in the U.S., that's less than one-tenth of one percent. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Redwood City, California. Oh, pretty fascinating. All right, when we come back, an update on our top stories. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, he was an undercover FBI agent assigned to infiltrate a small Al-Qaeda cell in Canada, plotting to blow up a Via Rail train. The agent known as Tamar Al-Nouri on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. This week was National Weight Watchers Week in Canada, and 900 overweight women held their annual convention in Hamilton. Most of us talk a great diet. Most of us actually do very little about it. Push, pull, push, pull. These battlers of the bulge have come together in their common warren. They go through a weekly weigh-in, pay their $2 lecture fee. I lost a ton of fat in my lifetime, but I never could keep it off until I found the Weight Watchers program. Now, most diets would put you on a 1,000-calorie-a-day program. The average junk lunch gives you 1,500 calories alone. Well, why not go for the extreme? Fasting, starvation, just stop eating. In Toronto, there is a clinic, and it will help you starve for seven days. The side effects of, of a six-day fast is not equivalent to more than the symptoms you might have from a three-day cold. 
In the past 10 years, fad diets have become more and more popular in Canada. I have tried the grapefruit diet, the banana diet, the citrus diet, the carbohydrate diet, the women's day diet. Swallow any pill. Hook up to any machine. Take inches off easily, the ads proclaim. HCG, made from the urine of pregnant women, is alleged to break down fat quickly. It's administered daily at $7 a shot. But the catch is, to make it work, you have to eat 500 calories a day or less. Dr. Stanley Bernstein's entire practice is devoted to HCG. A lot of people would call this a fat diet program. Yes, they would. Um, I feel it's because they're not aware of how well it works. The standard fat people's lament. 95% of all diets fail within five years. People know this, but they keep hoping, looking for the magic bullet that the diet business, despite its promises, can't deliver. Apparently there is very, very little that can be called successful dieting. The failure rate is fabulous. A quick recap now of our top stories. The finance minister announced this in the House of Commons today. I decided not only to sell all of my and my family's assets and the company I built with my father for 25 years, I've also decided to donate any difference in value in those shares from the time I was elected until now. But the trouble might not be over for Bill Morneau. The NDP wants the ethics commissioner to investigate whether Morneau was in a conflict of interest in sponsoring a pension reform bill. Mary Dawson says she will look into it. CBC News has learned that the federal government has quietly paid out settlements related to CIA-sponsored mind control experiments during the Cold War. Canadian citizens were subjected to mind-altering drugs, even electric shocks to the brain, as part of a secret project known as MKUltra. U.S. President Donald Trump declared America's opioid crisis a public health emergency today and announced new steps to stem the epidemic, which kills more than 100 people in the U.S. every day. But critics say the declaration doesn't come with any new money to fight the problem. That is The National for this Thursday night. For news anytime, go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Susan Ormiston. I'll see you here tomorrow. Thanks for watching.